Session three is foundations of electrophysiology, and we're picking up from what we had discussed last time. The whole goal of single unit physiology is to get very clean action potentials, nice clean signals. And we can see these sharp inflections as we discussed are the, are the action potentials of a single neuron firing. We can see that there's different morphologies even within the same trace. So there's a neuron here that looks different than how this neuron fires. What's very nice about this picture, this is a trajectory that we use in deep brain stimulation. And as we're going down through the brain, this level, we're at the top of the thalamus, and you can see it has a particular firing pattern. Then we're in this region, which is a little bit deeper in the thalamus. It has its own specific type of firing pattern. And as we go deeper into the brain and we hit the subthalamic nucleus, look at the, you know, it's very apparent that the neurons in the SDN fire differently than the neurons in the thalamus. Now, stand, as standard practice, when we do this in the OR, we actually listen to the activity. But when we plot the traces, it becomes very apparent that we can discern different regions of the brain just based on how the neurons are firing. This neuron down here is in the substantia nigra pars reticulata. It's a very regular pattern. The STN has a very high frequency, irregular pattern. Oftentimes, we can hear what is called beta oscillators in the recordings. So we can differentiate parts of the brain as long as we have clean signal. So the features we look at with spikes or action potentials is how fast they fire, the rate. Is there a pattern to it? Sometimes it's very regular. Other times it is very irregular. Also, the density of neurons i.e. how many neurons we can see in a recording also gives you information. So when we're in the putamen of the brain, for instance, the neurons are fairly spread out. So we don't record multiple as many multiple neurons at the same time. However, when we're in the subthalamic nucleus, it's a very compact structure with a lot of neurons very close. So we often record many neurons at the same time. However, in addition to the spiking pattern, you can often hear changes with movement or behavior in the background pattern. And that background consists of glia cells, anything around the neurons, but also neurons that are very distant that you can't discern or distinguish separately from the neurons that have very good signal, but you can still hear them modulate with behavior. So the background is often uh, very important for isolation. In terms of local field potentials, the background can be, you know, seen as very significant because it has many more neurons making up this background noise. Now, what's nice about recording at different parts of the brain is each brain structure seems to have very specific features, and we look at those features to know where we're at. I'm just putting up other examples of neurons firing. You can see the pattern is quite diverse. Here, we get this is a burst type of, of cell, so that fires rapidly and then shuts off and then fires rapidly, shuts off. We get other areas that don't quite have that bursting pattern. So as you can see, these clean recordings allow us to really differentiate parts of the brain. As we had talked about, what we're measuring is electrical changes in activity in the brain. And that's very important because we have lots of electrical type of activities outside of the brain that can interfere with how we do our recordings. As we talked about, neurons have charge separation. They use proteins to separate charge. So our electrodes are outside of the neurons, our MMEs are outside of the neuron, and we're measuring this charge differential. And when the neuron fires, we see the matrix of the brain change its electrical properties. Another important feature is the impedance of the electrode. Our MMEs, the microwires, are high impedance electrodes that allow us to record from single neurons. And in the brain, it's not electrons moving around, it's actually ions moving around that we're measuring. And those ions have charge, and that's what we are measuring. Movement and charge separation. We had talked about this before. Inside the cell, the proteins separate certain types of ions and pump out other types of ions through the same proteins. That creates a differential in voltage between the outside of the neuron and the inside of the neuron. So these membranes on the outside of the, or the proteins on the outside of neurons, actually they leak a little bit. So they're not 100% closed. So what we could do is measure that, that leak going across the membrane, but also the membrane itself, which in this picture would be located here, is made up of fatty substances, sort of like an insulator on a wire. So that resistance allows this separation to, to occur, there is a little bit of leak of ions back and forth, 
but basically the membrane creates a high resistance between the charges. There's two kind of fundamental things that I wanted to describe here, and that's the difference between resistance and impedance. And they are very, very similar. Everybody knows resistance, right? You have a, a water hose that you're pushing water through it. There's going to be some resistance, and that resistance is defined by the diameter of the hose and the pressure of the water going through it. So current flows that way. I mean, if ions are going through a tube, the bigger the hole, the less resistance. Fire is the same way. If you have a larger diameter wire, electrons flow through it much quicker than if you have a very small wire. Now, impedance is a little bit different because it takes also into account the frequency. So our electrodes, the macro contacts, have a different impedance than the micro contacts. And that different impedance, you can look at if you break it down by different frequencies, certain frequencies will flow faster through a low impedance than other frequencies. So our microelectrodes are very high impedance, and what we try to do is to limit the types of frequencies that can flow through them so we can more isolate neurons. This obviously would be chapters and chapters and books to discuss, but essentially resistance is the resistance of the flow of the ions, where impedance is also looking at the frequencies of the flow of electrical properties. The movement of charged ions, we actually discussed this. This is how uh, the cell membrane, that fatty part of the membrane I was talking about, and here's a protein that spans across it. And in this case, it's moving chloride ions outside of the neuron, which is making the extracellular matrix more negatively charged than the interior of the neuron. So acquisition systems. So acquisition systems have been around now for 50, 60 years, obviously, or even longer. They've gone through quite an evolution and change. Early acquisition systems were simply a wheel with a piece of paper with a little metal thing that moved up and down when the electrical activity is charged. And we spun the wheel at a certain rate and we would see the electrical changes in the brain wrapped around this chart. Completely analog system. Next, as things evolved, we now use pen charts. And we've seen these big systems for recording EEG, or at least if you're my age, you remember these. But it was a little pen that would put the lines on the piece of paper. Now we're in the digital world. So in the digital world, it's not analog anymore. It's called discrete time. So when we talk about discrete time, we need to sample the signal digitally fast enough that it appears to be analog to us. And what determines that is what are the frequency contexts of what we're looking at? So in local field potentials, the, the potentials move very slowly. So we have to sample at a certain rate. However, spiking activity is extremely fast. They, these sharp inflections are very fast. So we need to sample very quickly. And just as an FYI, when we do local field recordings on a, on a macro contact, we can record anywhere between 100 hertz, 500 hertz, or 1,000 samples a second. In order to adequately see spikes at a single unit level, we need to record at 25,000 to 40,000 samples a second. So the burden of the acquisition systems for doing single unit are greater than the burden for more purely analog signals. But there's different types of components to these new digital acquisition systems. I'll talk a little bit about amplifiers and how they help us record signals. I'll talk about filtering and how that helps us, as well as digitization. So different amplifiers. How these particular types of amplifier works is there's two inputs to these amplifiers, and the amplifier is this little triangle here. The first input, we'll say, is the recording tip of our electrode. And what we do is we take the signals, first signal goes into the top part, the second goes into the bottom, and they essentially subtract each other. Because one of them is recording neurons and the other is recording activity within the brain that is not necessarily single neurons. And what you hope it's recording is the noise. So when you take these two signals in and you subtract them, we can see this nice crisp neuron coming out. In this example, there's no noise. However, if you're in a situation where both of your signals are recording the same noise and you subtract them, you get zero output. It's a completely flat line. So what these differentials allow you to do is to record your recording signal and some other activity in the brain that is your noise. And when you subtract it, hopefully what you're left with is only the spiking activity. And the example down here, what we have are two different types of signals going in. 
they both appear like noise, but when you subtract them, they're slightly offset. So you actually reproduce a new signal. So these differential amplifiers are designed to help us get rid of noise. And I'll show you some examples. So as before we get to those examples, I'm going to be discussing bandpass filters. And what are bandpass filters? Well, bandpass filters are hardware and hardware implemented or software implemented or both. And essentially what they do is filter out signals that are irrelevant to the type of recording we're doing. So for instance, our single units down here are firing extremely fast and we're interested in that sharp inflection. So what we could do in hardware and software is say, get rid of all the frequencies that are slow and all the frequencies that are way too fast and just give me that frequency range where the spiking activity occurs. And if we look at these two traces, what we've done here is we've highly filtered this guy down here and up here, our filters are more wide open. So it's picking up frequencies that are very slow. But when we activate the filters, see how this slow activity is now flattened down. So it's gotten rid of the slow activities because we want to see the sharp spiking inflections. Up here, when we're looking at local field potentials, there may be some important information in this slow riding activity. So we want to see it. So what we do is, we move the filter so it allows in more slower frequency, and we move the other end of the filter so that the higher frequencies or these spiking activities are diminished. Now, you can see when they're on a spiking, there's a little bit of activity here, and then the slow activity, and then it seems to go fast, and you can see the fast activity correlates with the spiking. But these, by filtering differently, we can look at different types of information in the brain. This is what's happening mostly dendritically or in the matrix Around the neuron, the single unit activity is telling you, as we had discussed before, the generation of the action potential, which is the output of that neuron and a single neuron. Up here, these are collections of neurons. These are single neuron outputs down in these bottom traces. So as I discuss, a bandpass filter, when we record from the brain, there's many frequency components. There's slow stuff. There's very fast stuff. And what we try to do is design our filter so that we only get the frequencies that are important. When we're doing single unit, we look at particular frequency range. When we're doing local fields, we look at a different range. And we can change the filters to extract out what frequency components are of interest to us. And again, here's just that example. This is a wide filter. This is a single unit constrained filter. There's another very important example, and I discussed that when we sample digitally, neurons firing or any signal when it fires, we need to sample quick enough to actually see the frequencies of interest. So here's an example of a sine wave that's fairly fast. And every dot here is when our acquisition system took a sample, okay? In this example, we were actually sampling the signal too slow. So what happens is we don't see this, what it looks like. We see some derivation. And it actually looks like a much slower sine wave than the underlying signal we're trying to record. There's a theory called Nyquist theory, which essentially says we need to sample, you know, the number, we use different numbers, but I like to sample at least 2.5 samples of the fastest frequency. So what I like to see is this very fast sine wave. I want to get a sample here, a sample here, a sample here. And what happens is if we sample fast enough, when we connect the dots, we actually see the underlying frequency. So this is an undersampled. This is a sampled appropriately. Now, one thing is you could actually sample oversample where you're getting many more dots. Imagine there being five dots here. Oversampling isn't really a problem other than it takes a lot of memory for your computer and a lot of storage. If you're oversampling, it just creates very, very large files. But if you sample adequately, you'll see the underlying frequency of the signal that you're interested in. Getting back to impedance. So what we have here are two different tips with two different impedances. This is how the microelectrode would look in the brain. And as I stated before, the tip of the of one contact may, is roughly about 30 microns on a, on a, a typical DBS microelectrode. And that tip, as we said, the closer you are to this neuron, the higher the signal will be of that neuron spiking. This neuron's a little further away. So this the signal you would see over here would be a smaller spike. These neuron diameters are approximately uh, 15 to 18 micron diameters. 
So our contact on the microelectrode is is roughly in in about the about the size of the of the neuron or double it or so forth. However, we use different types of recording tips and different types of impedances. And the reason why we do this is certain parts of the brain, the neurons are very far apart. So what, what I like to do when I'm recording from a part of the brain that has neurons that are fairly dispersed is to use an electrode that has a little bit lower impedance. So I could see neurons that are further away. However, if I'm in a very dense part of the brain, like the subthalamic nucleus or maybe the hippocampus, I like to use a much higher impedance. And what that does is the higher impedance, you need to be closer to see the signal. So because of the, in the hippocampus, everything is so dense, by requiring to be closer to the neuron, you kind of get rid of the other neurons in the background because it, you'll just be inundated by spikes here. And it becomes very hard to separate neuron one from neuron B. So you can see this very high impedance electrode, we're getting nice isolation of one neuron firing. The lower impedance tip or the design of the tip allows you to see one spike firing here. This is neuron A. You can see it firing again here. And then another neuron, which is actually closer to the tip, firing much higher amplitudes. And you can see how it repeats. And it looks fairly consistent over time. So we can actually modify the impedance and, and tip of our electrode to match the type of recordings we're going to do. So this is what we do in the lab because we're so highly specialized. We have Faraday rooms that we can do recordings in and get absolutely pristine recordings in a research environment. As I said, here's our recording. We use our differential amplifier. It outputs the signal. You can see this neuron is probably one neuron, but you see it has this weird shape. See how it's oscillating? That oscillation, and I'm introducing a little bit of type of artifact we can see here. This is what's known as a cardioballistic effect. I'm just looking at the trace I would estimate is called what's called a cardioballistic effect. And what that is, is you have your recording electrode and a neuron, and there might be a nearby vessel. Every time you heart beats, it pushes the neuron a little bit closer when it beats, and then it moves back after the beat's done. So what happens is that small change in distance causes a small change in the amplitude of the neuron firing. The neuron's still firing uh, the same exchange of ions happening, but your distance between the electrode and the neuron is changing. So it makes it look to have this kind of oscillation to it. The same thing can happen with breathing as well. And there's many other types of movement artifacts that we'll, we'll discuss. I'm also going to introduce the signal to noise ratio concept. And what signal to noise ratio essentially is, is we have this background activity and then we have the sharp inflection of the neuron. Signal to noise, essentially, how far does this peak get away from this background noise? And the further it is away, the easier it is to discriminate single neurons. So in this trace, you can see there's a low firing guy here and then this higher firing guy. The signal to noise ratio is higher on this one because the peak is much further away from the baseline than this guy here. So this has a lower signal to noise ratio. This has a higher signal to noise ratio. In practice, before I, before I would actually commit to doing recordings in, in the lab, I preferred to have a 4.5 signal to noise ratio between the neurons I was recording and the background. And the reason why I did that is so that when I did my, my sorting of individual neurons, it just made it easier statistically for me to do. This is a very high signal to noise ratio. It's very easy to discern this neuron from anything that's happening in the background. Although if we blew it up, we could see there are smaller activities. These are very low signal to noise. These are very high signal to noise. Here's the example of a very high signal to noise and a lower signal to noise. So if I were to sort use sorting algorithms on this, I could clearly create neuron A from neuron B. So how do we achieve this type of recordings where these really good signal to noise is we want to get the electrode as close to the neuron as possible. And we want to filter the data to get rid of as much of the background non-significant noise. And we want to digitize the signal so that we're capturing these high frequency components so that we can see and visualize and actually statistically analyze this type of data. Bottom line, any research project, you want to have a data. Otherwise, why are you doing this? To get good data, we need to have good impedance electrodes. If we have good impedance and high signal quality, 
there's actually morphology, how the neurons fire. And as I discussed before, the morphology of, of the spike of an individual neuron will be different from neuron to neuron. So we can use the height to separate neurons and we can use that morphology of the spike to separate neurons. However, we have other challenges going on in the room. Aside from the technical sampling, filtering, and so forth, we have signal changes with movement. So for instance, if you're doing single unit recordings and the patient starts chewing hard candy, there's going to be this crunching noise, which will saturate our recordings. And that noise makes it very difficult to do the later work, which is analyzed in the data. The other thing is we have all kinds of electricity flowing in the room. We have it going to our, our pumps. We have it going to the compression socks that the patients have on. We have it going to light the room. We have electricity basically surrounding us. And that electrical devices actually generate artifact, which can affect our recordings. One of the biggest things is the lights in the patient's room, if they're, if they're fluorescent lighting, they generate huge amounts of electrical noise. So we like to use incandescent light bulbs in our recording environments, but that's not always possible, especially if you're doing this in the EMU. You just have to try to reduce the types of electrical problems we have. For instance, a lot of the pumps that are used for IVs, they can be in battery mode while we're doing our high quality recordings. So they can be unplugged from the wall and they can be on battery mode and supply the drugs that they need to. Obviously, when we go in and do research, we do not do anything without the permission of the clinical staff. So if, if we think that there's a pump that's generating noise, we do not touch it. We ask the nurse to, to see if we can actually modify the plugging and the unplugging of devices in the room. If you do have recording problems, roll a thumb. Your recording system is usually pretty standard. And problems typically aren't on the recording acquisition system side. They're usually in the cable from the electrode back through the cabling. Oftentimes, the cabling could be laying on a wire for uh, an electrical device, and it's picking up some artifact from that wire. There could be a bad solder point within the wire, which can lead to other types of noise. So really, from an electrophysiology standpoint, 90% of our effort as electrophysiologists is to get rid of the noise. The fun part is actually getting clean data and doing the analysis. The hard part is making sure we have that really crisp signal to noise ratio in our recordings. Other things to be aware of, sedation, for instance, sedation can affect your recording quality. When we're in the basal ganglia of the brain, for instance, and the patient's sedated, it tends to be very quiet. And as the patient maybe waking up from that sedation, you can hear the activities get louder and louder. And that's because the neurons are actively different between fully awake and not awake. Also, when we have patients who are sedated in some way, their cooperation with behavioral tasks can be often compromised. So we want to make sure that we have patient is awake, alert, and cooperate before we engage in any behavioral tasks. The other thing is if you're recording from sedated patients, you can't ask them to do things. For instance, in Parkinson's disease, we may stimulate, and, hey, hold your arm out and let's see how your tremor is. So when you're doing electrophysiology, you can't measure the tremor in a sedated patient. So you just be aware that the level of sedation can be an issue in, in our ability to record clean physiology. Movements. So I talked about the cardioballistic movements, and I talked about chewing during a recording. This is what chewing looks like on EEG. It may look like a seizure even to the untrained eye, but in reality, this is the patient eating. And every time they bite down, there's an activation that's recorded. And it's not really related to the neurons firing necessarily. It's related to this artifact, which as you can see, bleeds across all the channels when they're chewing. So getting back down to how neurons fire and how we use them. I talked about how we classify neurons. Caudate neurons have low frequency. There's two types. There's phasically active, which means they don't fire until you engage in behavior, then they fire. And then tonically active, which tend to fire all the time. Thalamus neurons are moderate to high frequency. They tend to be bursty. They have burst patterns to them. You can often see tremor cells if you're in a patient that has tremor and you're in the motor regions, and it's more or less regular kind of bursty type activity. The subthalamic nucleus is very high frequency, and oftentimes you can see oscillations in the beta range. 
in Parkinson's disease. The globus pallidus externus and SNR have moderate to high frequency. SNR is about 40 hertz. It has very regular patterns, and we see some regular type of patterns in GPE cells as well. Zona inserta. Zona inserta is the region between the thalamus and the SDN. It's mostly white fibers. And when we do our recordings, our electrodes tend to be more selective for the electrical pattern coming off the cell body versus the axon region. And there's some physics behind why it's easier to record from the cell body action potential or axon hillock potential than the rest of the axon. So in the zona inserta, we typically don't record single units because we're in axonal regions and there are cells there, but they're sparse, not as compelling as other gray matter targets. Likewise, the internal capsule of the brain, which is where all the big white fiber matters run, it's very hard to record single units because again, they're axons and axons are difficult to record from with extracellular electrodes. I'm just showing this again. This is how tracks look as we go down. There's obviously different patterns. Here's the thalamus. Here's one of the sparse neurons in zona inserta, but we can see it's low density in terms of neurons. It's firing, but not extremely fast. And then when we get in the subthalamic nucleus, we see many neurons with a pattern to it. We can see the oscillation actually in this trace. And when we get below it into substantia nigris parverticulata, there's a different pattern. The neurons are firing more regular down here. Interestingly enough, I put this picture down here because when we're doing recordings in the wake patients, this neuron here is responding to the patient moving the wrist. So when they flex the wrist and extend their wrist, you can see the neuron is actually firing with the movements. This neuron here is also firing with the arm. Down here, we have a neuron firing the hand opening. This arm is responding to what we call a chain pull, which is the activation of the muscles here. So sometimes the neurons aren't firing very much, but when we engage in behavior, they can be very isolated to very specific parts of the body. If you had a large macro contact in this part of the brain, the macro contacts are magnitudes bigger than the contact of our microelectrode. It would be very difficult to isolate specific body parts that it responds to. I just want to show you another track. This is another part. This is a part of the thalamus that we implant for Parkinson's. And as you see in this track, we have distinctly different types of firing. We have this low density firing at the dorsal part of the thalamus. Now we're in the VIM or the ventral intermediate zone of the thalamus. We have this kind of bursting activity. It's much faster. And uh, this part of the area of the brain will respond to movements and specifically motor movements. If we're a little bit further back in the thalamus, we'll get in the sensory that will respond to touching on the body part. So we can discern based on how it's firing and how it responds to behavior. And then a little deeper in the brain, we see a different change in the thalamic firing pattern. Same thing in another target. This is the putamen of the brain, globus pallidus externus and GPI. And as we're going down into the brain, we can discern this is a putamal recording, very low density. Neurons are firing very slow. As we go deeper, we hit GPE. This is a regular, what we call a pause burst neuron, very regular. And then it has these pauses in it. Then we get into this region here. This would be what we call a border cell. It's a very regular pattern. It doesn't tend to respond to movements and a, a characteristic pattern when we're transitioning between GPE and GPI. There's this region where we can record these cells. And then when we get into GPI, we can see there's two patterns, very high frequency, a regular, and then a bursting pattern. So again, the pattern of activity tells us where we are located. We go out the bottom, bottom of the GPI, it becomes quiet. That's because we're in this region right above the optic track, hard to record neurons in these regions. So now we're going to get into different types of artifacts and, and go through them more thoroughly. So we have mechanical artifacts. I talked about cardioballistic pulsations or cardioballistic activities. Patient movement, I gave you an example of chewing, but obviously if the patient shakes their head or is moving around while you're doing recordings, that can create artifacts. So when we do behavioral tasks, we tend to ask the patients to try to sit as still as they can. Obviously, we don't do behavioral tasks when they're having dinner. We try to make them concentrate on the task and try to move as little as possible. However, as I said, we can have a bad connection. There could be a bad soldering in our cable. And these are oftentimes very hard to troubleshoot. 
because it looks like the signal is good. And then a very slight movement causes that contact to move. And then we get bad signal. And it tends to be aperiodic and hard to isolate. Unfortunately, the activities sometimes you see look like a neuron firing, but they're not. So as I had mentioned very early on, we need to know what the spike should look like before we can diagnose certain types of artifacts. Bad connectors are very difficult artifacts sometimes to fix. However, there are other types of artifacts that saturate our signal. For instance, if we have a lot of appliances working in the room or we have electrical discharges of certain types, they are so big relative to the neurons that now we can't to see the little neurons because our artifacts are just saturating our whole signal. In that case, you can't really do anything with the signal unless you can get rid of the noise. Some common examples, static discharge. We've all done this. We walked across a carpeted floor. We touch a doorknob and we feel that zap. That zap can actually, can actually occur and we can see it in recordings. So if the patient's building static discharge or something in the room is causing a static buildup of charge, it, when it discharges, it's going to have a sharp spike and it will kind of look like a neuron. However, they're typically low frequency. So you'll see it and then it disappears for a while and you'll see it again. Those are more static discharges. We also have what are called EMF, which is electromagnetic fields. And then finally, ground loops, which is a very complicated type of artifact that we'll be discussing. So I discussed cardioballistic effect. Here's that effect. Oftentimes, if we have a highly single isolated neuron, the cardioballistic effect won't affect me too much. I can, I can actually separate this neuron. However, if we have multiple neurons here and their signals are going up and down, it becomes very difficult to isolate and separate neurons. Again, patient movement, broken wires. These can occur at a connector of the microelectrode. They can occur in the cable that goes to the amplifiers of the acquisition system. There could be a problem with your amplifiers. Sometimes amplifiers go bad. Finally, it could be the electrode. And the reason why the electrode is so far down here is you want to discount all the things that are not in the patient before you start thinking about what's in the patient. Because this, this is very hard to solve. What do you do? Change your electrode. If you're in the OR, you see that the electrode's bad, you might want to change it there. Or sometimes if the patient's in the EMU and they're implanted, there's really nothing you can do if you have a bad electrode at that point. These are the things that you want to check first because they're low cost and have no consequence to the patient. Once you start looking at the electrode, there can be consequences that you need to consider for patient. The other thing is do not overlook corrosion and dampness. For example, our connectors are made out of metal. And if you expose them to the environment, for instance, if you have copper connectors, we know that the directional or wind direction finders on the top of a building that are made out of copper, they turn green after a while. That is corrosion building up on the surface of the copper. Well, if you connect two copper connections that have corrosion, it's going to impede the signal that's passing through them. So one good thing is to make sure that your connectors are clean. The electrodes that we put in the patient, they're coming directly out of manufacturing. So they're going to have nice clean surfaces typically, unless something gets on them in the OR. So you want to make sure that there's nothing on them from the OR setting and the connector you're bringing to them. You want to make sure there's no corrosion on the cable connector. For instance, our connector that goes through the acquisition system has copper pins in it. You want to make sure that they don't look corroded because that could simply be the problem that you have. And that corrosion can be fixed in a couple ways. You clean it with a cloth. In my electrophysiology lab, I had a little sandpaper that I used to scrape the metal surface to get the corrosion off. Or you could just simply replace the cable. And typically, the corrosion will likely happen on the acquisition cable side of this process. This is a signal saturation. And the example I have here is a device called a transmatic, transcranial magnetic stimulation system. And what this essentially is, is a very large inductor that you put a lot of current through and it generates a magnetic field that can activate neurons within the brain. I have a recording electrode in the brain. And what happens is I can see spikes here. This is this neurons highly isolated. But if I apply this TMS, this very high input fluctuation to the brain, the amplifiers actually shut off. And what will happen is you get the artifact of the TMS now the amplifier shut off and see how the, the signal's extremely smooth here. There's no background, but we see these sharp inflections still. What are they? Is that a neuron firing? 
No, this TMS system is delivering multiple pulses. And every time it pulses, it resaturates the amplifier. So no neurons can be recorded here. And then eventually the amplifiers recover. We see some neuronal activity and then our spiking pattern again. So we can be fooled. This artifact looks like our neuron, but it's not. It's the amplifier saturated and recording the sharp electrical activation every time the TMS system went off. So we can be full, but when you get a signal and it's flat here, that's a pretty good indication that the amplifiers are saturated because you see the normal background has some fluctuation to it. Here's an example of static electricity discharge. We have a balloon that's built some charge. You, know, you can rub it against the floor of your shirt, build some charge up on it. And then when it makes contact with a surface, it discharges, creating a sharp wave of varied shape. Oftentimes the morphology of the shape is different and it's more aperiodic. EMF, electromagnetic fields. They tend to be very regular and they can be irregular. And I'll, I'll describe that in a second. But essentially all this electrical things around us, including the sun, all discharge different frequencies in the EMF range. And the wavelengths are different depending on what's generating it. Here, radio and TV is in a very slow wavelength. Radiation that's used produces gamma rays. This is extremely high frequency signal. Ultraviolet lights in this range. X-rays are in this range. So what we can see is different types of devices create different types of EMF. And these EMF, if they're not dealt with by our acquisition systems or filtering, just saturate our signal and make it unusable. So what I said is we create these filters. And what the filters do is, it says, this is my frequency range of interest. Get rid of all the slower frequencies and all the higher frequencies because they're not within the neuronal signal that I'm trying to record. And then what we have to deal with now is the stuff in here. We deal with this by unplugging things in the room, you know, turning the lights down and so forth. But this is what the filters essentially do. It gets rid of low frequencies that are not of interest and high frequencies that are not of interest. However, our bandpass filters are not perfect and they do fail. They tend to get rid of some of the signal, but not all the signal. And that's because bandpass filters have what are called shoulders. So it's not a perfect cutoff of all the frequencies above. It actually has what's called a shoulder. And that shoulder gets rid of some of the frequencies here, but the further you get away from the, the edge, the more it filters. So that shoulder, you're still getting some escaping frequencies into your signal on both sides. That shoulder exists. It's just the process is we cannot create perfect filters and all of our filters do have shoulders of some type. The other thing, no matter how good your filters are, if you have a really high amplitude bad signal in the room, it will leak right through your filters. So for instance, if you're getting rid of some oscillating current, an extremely high amplitude because of the way it's being transmitted, no matter what you do, you're not going to get rid of it with your filters. So you either deal with the device, try to change the environment so that the recordings are better, but essentially, if you have a high frequency, you're not going to get rid of it. A good example, sometimes patients have pacemakers for, for neurotherapies or other therapies. If you turn that on, it's going to create this really high frequency artifact to your recordings. And no matter what you do with your filters, you're never going to get rid of that artifact. So in certain cases with DBS leads, for instance, when we're doing electrophysiology and surgery and they have a pacemaker, we, we simply just have to turn that other pacemaker off so that we can see the brain activity. Mitigating other types of noise like that become difficult. And obviously, you want to make sure that whatever you do doesn't compromise the clinical importance of the patient being there. Issue is sometimes one frequency dominates the band and that will saturate, will saturate you even outside of your filter range. Keep in mind also there are what are called sub and beat harmonics. So for instance, when you hit a piano key, you get a dominant frequency of that one key. However, if you look at the frequency components of the sound, we get what are called subharmonic. Now a subharmonic, a frequency will stay at 150 hertz. So at 75 hertz, there's a peak in the frequency range, but it's smaller. Likewise, at 300 hertz, there's another peak, but it's smaller. The dominant frequency is 150. The doublet is 300. Half of it is 150. So even though we think we're getting rid of some frequency that's way out here, 
it can still produce an artifact at what are called a sub-frequency. To make things more complicated, we can also have what are called beat frequencies. So in this scenario, you hit one key on your piano and you get a dominant frequency here. We hit another key, we get a dominant frequency here. Division between those two frequencies, you can get a peak. So let's use the example of 10 hertz. Essentially what happens is with a beat frequency, some combination of the two individual keys can create an artifact. So let's say one key is being filtered, the other key is on the other side of the filter. That combination can actually be within our filter and it will produce a small artifact in our recording. And then I'm gonna, I'll give you a figure for ground loops here. A special case and very hard to deal with are what are called ground loops. So in a ground loop scenario, we know, for instance, when you take a plug and you plug it in the wall, there's two prongs, positive and negative, and that third prong, which is your ground on the plug. That ground goes back to some electrical box, and then hopefully it's isolated so that our electronics can filter it out. However, there can be scenarios, for instance, we have one outlet in our electrical box that, that actually goes to three different outlets. And if you plug a device into outlet one and outlet two, the grounds are picking up noise from each of those devices individually, and it can create some very complicated noise. And it will be some frequency range that, that may be difficult to understand. And then it can be complicated because you could have three, four different devices connected. So what we modern amplifier systems tend to have what are called uh, filters on them, a special type of filter that you put in, you plug into the wall, it then conditions the wall current going into the acquisition system and produces a clean signal, hopefully on the other side. So that way our acquisition system doesn't pick up all the noise coming from the wall. It's filtered out by this special conditioning box. And that's all I have for you for this session.